¿Qué tal todos? ¿Cómo están? Bien, bien. Disfrutándolo, ¿eh? When I was um, a middle school teacher, my second year at AP Solis Middle School in Donna, Texas, I had a group of kids um, right after lunch. You know the type if you've ever been in education. And they were struggling readers, um, and we would come in the classroom, I'd take out the state-adopted textbook and try to share stories with them. And their reaction always frustrated me. Nombre, sir, chale. This is boring, I don't understand it. What's going on, sir? Ni se le entiende una palabra, no get one word. And thinking about the issues that I was having with these kids, I thought back to my own childhood. What was it that had gotten me interested in reading? And I realized, in a sort of epiphany, that my love of the tales that my grandmother, Garza, would tell me, that my uncle Joe on his ranch, that my aunts in their kitchens would tell me, these were the things that had gotten me really hooked on stories and wanting to read. So the next day, I came into the class, I rolled my chair to the center of the room, dimmed the lights, and I said, listen, young friends, to the tale of La Mano Pachona. <laughs> They were stunned and silent, hanging on every word as I narrated the story of that hairy demon hand that crawls to the dark places of northern Mexico and the Rio Grande Valley, looking for misbehaving children to drag away into the darkness. <laughs> the students couldn't believe their ears. They were startled to learn that I came from a family with Mexican-American heritage, that I had heard the same stories that they had heard from abuelos and tios. Something changed for us that day. Where there had been conflict and misunderstanding, there was now a sense of shared identity. I'd proven myself part of a group that they belonged to, no longer just as the teacher, but as a storyteller, as if the mantle had slipped from my grandmother's shoulders to drape across my own. I began to craft written versions of these stories and to show my students how to do the same thing, to embed the folklore of their families into contexts that made them more like literary stories. And that year, it taught us so much about each other. And I learned more than I could have ever possibly imagined from those kids about how story undergirds identity, both your personal identity, your identity as a community, and the global community at large. What was it that made each of us in that room an individual? Well, psychologists and philosophers have increasingly begun to see identity, personality, as a sort of mental construct that we establish, a, a sort of narrative fiction that we use to navigate life, to make sense of it. Adriana Cavarero, an Italian philosopher, talks about our desire for a narratable life. The idea that we want, at the end of our days, for people to look at us and see the pattern of the story of our lives. At the heart of this narratable life, stands our identity, a personality that accretes over time from different types of inputs, genetics, experience, culture. Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, calls this the center of narrative gravity. In other words, all of us, in order to make sense of our own identities, tell a story to ourselves about our own lives, making ourselves the protagonists. Now, the, the pattern of this narrative we tell ourselves about our lives is typically drawn from the stories we hear as children, the stories that I grew up listening to and that the kids in my classroom 20 years ago had also heard. Carl Jung, the famous psychologist, and the mythologist Joseph Campbell both kind of encountered a similar pattern that spread across the world in stories that they called the monomyth, or the hero's journey. And you may be familiar with this basic um, premise. There is a person who's called to action, He goes on an adventure that he accepts. At the end of many trials and tribulations, he emerges triumphant and comes back to his community to bring something to them, something special they didn't have before. Clearly, all of us want to be the good guys. We, want to, we don't want to be the villains of our stories, right? And as a teacher, understanding this tendency of seeing ourselves as the protagonist, it really helped me to move past the conflicts that we had in that classroom, and the discipline issues, to see my students' desire for self-worth and heroism. Interestingly, the hero's success in the hero's journey is dependent on his helpers, isn't it? 
French philosopher Paul Ricoeur reminds us that in a story, each character's individual identity always intersects with those of other characters in the story. And in the same way, our individual identities in a community are constituents with the identities of other people in our community. They all intersect. Ricoeur calls this the we identity, as in the shared identity that we have in the Rio Grande Valley that many of our speakers have talked about this morning. When I was a teenager, a long time ago, in the 80s, um, I was in progress with my father. We were filling up in gas, getting Mexican Cokes in the back of our car, you know, those, those good times back before people were shooting places up. And he was talking to the attendant at the Pemex station in Spanish, and he got in the car and we were driving back out, and I said, Dad, what's the deal with us? How is it that we can speak Spanish and our last name is Bowles? Why are my cousins Garza and Perez and Casas? What's the deal? I mean, I know my mom is white, but you know, what's going on here? And he told me, look, don't worry about it too much. You and I, our family, we're border folk. We're, we have bloodlines that cross and recross boundaries of culture and rivers and, and language. Each of us is who he is, wholly unique unto himself. And you shouldn't fear, you shouldn't be nervous because you've been frontier forged, David. Frontier forged. It was a great lesson, but I only understood half of it at the time. Um, I was so driven to become an individual intellectual, academic, rebelling against the norm, and according to me, the rebel without a cause, that I felt to see that I was a thread in a larger fabric, the fabric of my community. And it had gotten to the point that here I was in that classroom 20 years ago, talking to these students as if we weren't part of the same group, seeing them as other. That arrogance still strikes me to this very day. Our we identity that we share here in the Rio Grande Valley and that people share in areas across the United States and the world draws on many funds of knowledge um, as cohesive glue, not the least of which are the stories of our folklore, largely dependent on what Walter Ong calls orality to differentiate it from literacy. Oral cultures put great stock in things like shared experience and memory, community, the elders that know the story. And these storytellers, usually elders, are seen as the repositories of the shared community knowledge. Um, the Nahua people that we now call the Aztecs, they used to call their storytellers Sazanile. And Sazanile means literally those who possess legends. What a great term, those who possess legends. And though literacy has wended its way through our community, we still cling to the vestiges of that age-old orality here in the Rio Grande Valley. We are very much an oral culture with a nice little sheen of literacy on top. And that's the powerful tradition that I tapped into 22 years ago in that middle school classroom, a wee identity that I continue to explore to this day in my writing and in speaking engagements, especially with young people. Our local tales of lechuzas, the shape-shifting witches in owl form, um, la llorona, that weeping woman who drowned her children out of despair for her husband's mistreatment. Um, and of course, my favorite, los duendes, the, st the strange little goblins, right, that hide in their beds and in closets and sneak off into the night with children. These are all important, not because of any kind of objective truth about them, but because of what they say about us as a people. Even more revelatory for me was the understanding, however, that we could leverage this we identity and these stories into a global we identity, that we could bind us together as a human race. Um, fields as disparate as comparative mythology, evolutionary psychology, suggest that there exists what anthropologist Donald Brown has called human universals, these characteristics of human culture that cut across the boundaries of, of time and space. They share structures and themes um, that really remind us that there's something innately human about storytelling that binds us all together. And I want you to imagine for a second, imagine curricula in our schools that explored these patterns that would celebrate the diversity of our local culture while also leveraging the commonalities that we share with other cultures um, for greater unity.
Um, think about, again, courses that would compare societies, literatures, religions, languages, making deep and powerful connections about these commonalities. Having cultural events here that not only celebrate our local culture, but also those of our sister communities. What an amazing thing. What about entertainment that instead of ridiculing what is different, rejoiced in the variegated experience of the human creature? It's my firm belief that we move forward together or not at all. Going back to Paul Ricoeur, he suggested that in ethical terms, universal stories, these that cut across our we communities in a global sense, foster the importance of the identities of others over the self. The narrative unity, that, that, that pattern that we want people to see when we pass away and they look back over our lives, it's made up of moments of responsiveness to others or lack thereof. And the responsive self, the kind of self that's going to be willing to put others first and think of a global we identity, that type of self isn't looking just for autonomy. It puts others first, living in hopes that its responsiveness to them will create a better society, not just for the self, but for all people. And I know, I know that when you hear this, it sounds like a fairy tale. I know that it sounds like this is a great story that Bowles is spinning. And it is a story, guys. It's the oldest story in the world. It's the story of human redemption. It starts with you and me. And if we're to save ourselves and to save our species, we have to look at the commonalities in our stories and tell them again and again. Thank you very much.